Hey, what's up, guys? Alonso Football Talk here. Kicking off a divisional draft breakdowns, which we're going to do over the next month. We're going to talk about two divisions every week one from the NFC and one from the AFC each, going clockwise, north, east, south, and west. And this is going to be more of a podcast version where I just let all my thoughts flow here. For this exercise, I'm first going to run through all the names of the players that were drafted, discuss them individually and where I think they fit with the new teams, then discuss the class as a whole, and when I'm done with all four teams of a division, I'm going to rank the classes against each other. Not really a big fan of the draft grades thing necessarily, I'm not sure if it really represents the way I feel about classes, and I'm not sure if it's always necessary to do that, but just looking at them as a whole, what I liked, what I didn't like, how I think they will fit with the new team, I think all those things are important. And now let's just start with the first team here, and we'll run through them alphabetically. So the first one here is the Chicago Bears. The first round, 11th overall, Justin Fields, the quarterback out of Ohio State. Round 2, 39th overall, Tevin Jenkins, the offensive tackle out of Oklahoma State. Then they didn't pick until the 5th round, 151st overall, Larry Borum, the offensive tackle, slash interior offensive lineman out of Missouri. Then they had 3 picks in the 6th round, 217th, 221st, and 228th overall, with Khalil Herbert, the running back out of Virginia Tech, Daz Newsom, the wide receiver out of North Carolina, and Thomas Graham Jr., the cornerback out of Oregon. And then they came back in the 7th round, 250th overall, Kyrie Stong with the interior defensive lineman out of BYU. And Chicago kind of stole the show Thursday night when they traded up 9 spots to select Justin Fields, their quarterback of the future. Just a couple months ago, he was looked at as the consensus number 2 overall quarterback behind only Trevor Lawrence, and he was kind of falling, it felt like, throughout this process. Not totally sure why, because there's nothing new on tape that you saw. Kind of ridiculous, personally, to me. I had him as the number 3 quarterback, but to get him here 11th overall for the Bears, which were one of the least exciting offenses in the league, I think he just definitely brings some excitement for that whole fan base. Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy, this might save their job if he works out. And he's far from a perfect prospect in terms of some of the decision making, the eye discipline, not getting off that first read, but so much talent, the athleticism, being able to extend plays, make things happen when there's nothing there. Just a big arm to push the ball down the field. When Andy Dalton is the only other quarterback on that roster right now, that will definitely be an upgrade and definitely, like I said, the excitement for the fan base. Bears football all of a sudden got interesting again. So I thought that was a phenomenal pick, giving up a first round of next year. And I think it was a third round of this year, swap of late round picks as well. I actually don't really care that much what they gave up. To me, he was worthy of the third overall pick even though the San Francisco, to me, definitely took the right guy for them personally. But Justin Fields at 11th overall, I thought pretty much was the best move of day one. And then he came back in the second round and select Tevin Jenkins out of Oklahoma State, who to me had a late first round grade. There are some limitations with his arm length, and there are more athletic profiles out there at the tackle position. But just the mean streak he brings in all facets of the game, the ability to move people in the run game, especially on those zone type of runs, that that zone is especially what the Chicago Bears like to run. Really good technician to make up for some of those deficiencies that he has. I think he's gonna be a day one starter on the left or right side. Releasing Charles Lando was a little surprising to me, definitely, and that kind of complicates things. Dealing with Jenkins over to the left side, where he has limited experience in college, but to me is more of a natural right tackle. So they'll have to figure out what they did, but definitely a great move as well. The only thing here, they give up the third round pick for it to move up a few spots here as well. I think they were 52nd overall. Also a swap of 5th to 6th rounders, uh, which they got the better value out of. But still, some of those middle round picks is really where you build up your team. So I didn't love that, but Jenkins altogether as a player, definitely a like. And because of that, they didn't pick until the 5th round, where they selected Larry Borum out of Missouri, who played right tackle as well for the Tigers. But when you look at the athletic profile, Projects maybe better to guard, even though I have to say, very quick kick slide, definitely moving faster than you would think for a guy's size, he's a massive hawking tackle prospect. Not sure if he's quite ready to start day one, but definitely packs a lot of power, has, like I said, underrated quickness for that size, and when he gets hands on people in the past game, it, there's not much they can do afterwards. So, I think Borum, maybe not starting day one, but he's somebody that you like as a depth piece, Maybe having that positional flexibility and someone you can develop down the road 
who can enter that starting lineup. And then I just loved what they did in the sixth round with Khalil Herbert, who was my number 10 overall running back. Great compliment to what they already have in David Montgomery. Just has a little bit more of explosiveness, that ability to stick his foot on the ground and go on those zone run type schemes. A lot of outside zone of Virginia Tech, but has the toughness to run inside, has that contact balance to gain yards through contact. So I definitely think in the 200s to get him, that is phenomenal value to me. In terms of rushing attempts, he should already get more work than Tariq Cohen from day one. Daz Newsome, not as exciting to me. I get what they see in that type of player, but I thought there were better options out there with like a Kate Johnson who actually went undrafted. Presents a very similar skill set, but to me, just a little more juice. And yeah, like I said, Newsome, he's a guy who got a lot of touches in the North Carolina offense, a lot of screens, speed sweeps, all that kind of stuff. So like I said, I see what they want in that type of player. Just this player in particular, to me, there were better options out there. But then Thomas Graham Jr., the corner out of Oregon, didn't play last season, opted out of the year. And that definitely cost him. But you watch him at the senior bowl practices, just really highly competitive. Not the tallest guy, but really fights hard at the catch point. Not letting guys get into the releases. He's somebody who can play at the line of scrimmage or back up from it. Has pretty quick change of direction. You can put it in the slot probably, where they have a lot of bodies there, but he can be competing if they are fine with the outside corners. They brought in Desmond Truth on this offseason, and they have like three other guys who would project best to nickel. Uh, they drafted the last couple of years or just brought in via free agency. So not totally sure where he lines up, but at the very worst, he's a really nice step piece. And then you have Kyrie Tonga, who's kind of the same uh, in the middle here for Eddie Goldman. To me, more of a like fifth round pick. So like an early day free guy at that nose position, a lot of natural strength, being able to toss blockers around. So you can definitely get him out there as a run defender, maybe in the pass rush department, lacking some versatility, more of a power rusher, just pushing up the middle of the pocket. But to get that type of guy in the seventh round, who can be a quality piece in the rotation, you get him out there, defend the run, then sub him out and you get other guys out there on third downs just to have that guy in the seventh round, when you're kind of lucky if you're getting guys that actually stick on the roster. Uh, that definitely works for me. So the Bears as a whole found their franchise quarterback of the future, a fixture at either tackle spot, even though I didn't love the value of what they had to give up for him. And then, like I said, at the worst, some quality depth throughout the rosters. So definitely like what they did. And I think with Fred and Graham, those two guys in particular, they could have an impact early on in their rookie campaigns and really play a lot of snaps for the Bears. And with that, we move on to the Detroit Lions. And you really have to acknowledge here, new general manager Brad Holmes and head coach Dan Campbell, they knocked it out of the park. And they were talking about those kneecap biters pre-draft. And that's kind of the type of guys that they got. So let's run for these names. Round one, seventh overall, Pinay Sewell, offensive tackle Oregon. Round two, 41st overall, Levi Musariki, the interior defensive lineman out of Washington. Round three, 72nd overall, Aleem McNeil, another interior defensive lineman out of NC State. Round three, 101st overall, Ifeitu Melifanwu, the cornerback out of Syracuse. Back to back fourth round picks, 112th and 113th overall, Amon Rasim Brown, the wide receiver out of USC, and then Derek Barnes, the linebacker out of Purdue. And then they had to wait until the seventh round. When they selected Jamar Jefferson, the running back out of Oregon State. And let's just start at the top here. Panay Sewell was my personal number two overall prospect. And if it wasn't for Trevor Lawrence, one of the best quarterback prospects that we've had in recent years, this guy has a chance to be the number one guy on my board. The best offensive tackle prospect that I've scouted over the last decade. Certainly not perfect from a technical perspective in terms of his footwork and some of the balance things and pass protection. But this guy gets after it in the run game. And his athleticism to get out on the move and put hands on people in space is just phenomenal. It's the best I've ever seen. Like, there were plays for Oregon. They're throwing a swing screen to the running back. And he has a wide nine defensive end out there. And he's basically asked to reach block that guy. And you just think of it, he's all the way out there. And you basically can't allow him to get upfield at all. Get in front of him, shield him, get the running back out to the edge. That is almost impossible. But with Sewell, you see those things on tape. Will you see it at the next level where there's freak athletes all over the place? Maybe not quite, 
but those are just phenomenal things that you can see on tape. The movement skills at 320 plus pounds are just unmatched. And like I said in past pro, there are some issues that he definitely has to clean up. But we have to remember here, when you go back to the 2019 tape since he opted out last year, this guy is a true sophomore, 19 years old, dominated defensive ends in college. And he more than held his own as a pass protector as well, even though there were some issues that he has to clean up. It's even more impressive thinking the success that he had, even though he, there's still things he can fix. So I think that pick, Brad Holmes and those guys, they were super excited in the draft room when you look at it afterwards. That was one of the best picks on day one. And then they come back round two and three, and I'm kind of lumped them together here because what they did to me is get a completely new interior defensive line. Liban Wusirike at Washington, he kind of played out of position as a shade nose or even true zero technique. To me, he's more of a free technique, kind of that guy who you can teach to get up the field, be disruptive in that way. Really strong anchor for being more of an undersized defensive tackle. Already flashed some great ability in the pass rush department. But like I said, as a run defender, he was facing some combo blocks and double teams on the very inside in those A-gaps. And he more than held his own in that department. So he definitely won't have a problem uh, stacking up those down blocks and just holding his ground. But, but like I said, just get up field, shoot up the B-gap and be disruptive in a penetrating role. That's more what he's going to be at the next level. And Aline McNeil is the perfect complement to that because you can put him at zero or at one and it's over. He's an immovable object in the middle of that defense. Maybe not the greatest skills as a pass rusher. You have to say here as well, didn't have the luxury of really playing outside the A-gaps. But in terms of somebody who's just going to hold his ground, toss bodies to the side when the ball carry approaches, being able to allow Levi to get up the field and be that type of player and not have those huge lanes in the middle. I think those two fit really well together. And then we move on. At the very back of the third round of day two, you got a Fatou Milfanwu, the cornerback at Syracuse. He was my number nine overall corner. And I think I had him kind of fringe second to third round. Uh, there are some issues as well. And there are some things that he has to clean up as well. Didn't play a lot of press coverage actually in college, even though his skill set, when you look at the athletic profile, would project well to that kind of role. And he's a lanky corner, so change of direction. There are some better corners in this draft, but for his size, he's pretty darn good in that regard. Has that ability, that gliding speed, uh, to kind of carry post routes down the middle, pass them on to the safeties, being able to just stick on the outside and not get run by on go routes, and definitely fights hard in the run game, trying to get off blocks and make tackles for short yardage. So I think he was a great value here as well. I could see him competing for an outside corner spot, day one potentially, and definitely year two. And then on day three, I'm on Rossing Brown, the wide receiver at USC. You get a tough, competitive receiver in the slot. He played more on the outside, the ex receiver, in that role of Michael Pittman Jr., who he had the year before. And he played pretty well there too. But I think maybe not the type of speed down the boundary to be the type of guy. But you, like I said, you put him in the slot, the toughness, the route running, just that feel for space, being able to help out. Uh, they bring in Jared Goff now. He's a great security blanket, kind of what he had in Cooper Cup or Robert Woods because they were kind of interchangeable. You put St. Brown out there. I can't even count the amount of times that his quarterback was moving around and he had to find some space, being able to work his way free and support his quarterback in that regard, find that throwing window for him because the Lions desperately needed some wide receiver help. And to get him in the 100s here, that is definitely not what I expected. I thought he was going on day two. And then Derek Barnes, he's an interesting guy. Maybe doesn't have that sideline to sideline range. Maybe not even your prototypical stand-up backer. Because last year, I think he was rushing from the outside about half of the snaps anyway. So maybe they look at him more as an outside pass rusher anyway. But a very physical player, like I said, can play on the end of the line of scrimmage and take on blocks. Or play on the second level and do the same type of things with blockers coming at him. He gives them some versatility here. Whichever front they want to really play. I'm guessing with Levi and the Liam McNeil. And with the defensive coordinator Aaron Glenn there. They're going to be more of a 4-3 in base personnel. But a lot of the pieces that they have already in the front 7. Would allow them to be more multiple in that regard. And then finally 7th round Jamar Jefferson. Had him as a top 10 running back as well. The athletic testing definitely scared me away a little bit. I think he ran into four sixes and just not very impressive overall. But when you put on the tape, 
a very natural runner. And when he watches run against Oregon action in the season opener, he has like a breakaway 85-yard touchdown run. He did not look like he's running 4 6 so I'm not sure if that number quite correlates to what we see on tape. Like I said, very natural runner, being able to change up speeds, find creases. You can run gap schemes with him, manipulating second level defenders and opening up lanes for himself. He can run zone, press the front side, stick his foot on the ground and get up field. And he really becomes a load to bring down, runs really hard, has some contact balance to him. So to pair him up with DeAndre Swift is more of that inside thumper. Especially after just letting go carry on Johnson, that makes a lot of sense to me. And when they got him, that probably made Johnson expendable. So overall, to me, an all-pro level offensive tackle, basically a new interior defensive line. Plus they brought in Michael Brockus over the offseason to add on top of that. So they could also be running like a three-man down line with two four eyes or one four eye in the five, and that zero being a Lee McNeil in the middle, being able to clock those a gaps. Then they get a top 10 corner prospect in this class at the very end of day 2, who like I said will be competing for a starting gig from day 1 potentially, a tough dependable slot receiver, a versatile linebacker, and then Jefferson as that number 2 running back as a 7th rounder maybe. So pff, I just love what they did. And with that we move on to the Green Bay Packers. Round 1, 29th overall, Eric Stokes the cornerback out of Georgia. Round 2, 62nd overall, Josh Myers, the interior offensive lineman out of Ohio State. Round 3, 85th overall, Amari Rogers, the wide receiver out of Clemson. Round 4, 142nd overall, Royce Newman, offensive tackle Ole Miss. Round 5, 173rd overall, to Daryl Slayton, the interior defensive lineman out of Florida. Round 5, 178th overall, Shamar Jean Charles, the cornerback out of Appalachian State. 2-6 round pick, 214th overall, Colvin Lanen, the offensive tackle slash interior offensive lineman out of Wisconsin, 220th overall, Isaiah McDuffie, the linebacker at the Boston College, and then in the 7th round, 256th overall, Callan Hill, the running back out of Mississippi State. First and foremost, I think Packers fans didn't really care what happened in the draft after the Rogers news came out, but we're going to focus on this draft class now. I don't have any extra information Rogers anyway. So first round, Eric Stokes, the corner out of Georgia. And I'm sure fans wanted some help for Rogers. Get one of those top tier wide receivers. But Stokes to me, unlike most people, I didn't hate it. He was, I think, my 35th or 36th overall player. And I really like him as a corner. I actually preferred him to Tyson Campbell, who went at the top of the second round, who a lot of people had higher. But I think Stokes, when you look at him these last couple of years at Georgia, 2019, he's one of the better corners out there. And this past season, other than Patrick's attaining the SEC, I thought he was the best corner out there. Excellent and versatile with his technique in press coverage, being able to change up two-handed jams, keep him straight up, push him into the boundary, take away that space to the sideline, but also has the change of direction to play in that off-zone coverage, which is going to play more for new defensive coordinator Joe Barry, Coming over from Los Angeles, where I work with Brandon Staley, in that too high safety, quarters coverage, you don't really know what they're doing, rotating one of those safeties down, expanding them into a cover two, all these different things that they can do. And he's probably going to be the starting field side corner, taking over for Kevin King, who the Packers don't really want to hear about right now anyway, after what happened in the playoffs, that long touchdown at the end of the half, given up to the Buccaneers, that really set the tone for that game. I didn't expect him to go Stokes here, but I don't hate it, like a lot of other people out there. Maybe a little early compared to where most people had him, but you have that 4 to 6 speed. He's probably not going to have anybody run by him on vertical patterns, which is definitely one of the priorities for the Packers here. And then they come back in the second round, and they get a replacement for center, Corey Lindsley, 62nd overall with Josh Myers here at Ohio State. And before I get into Myers, I definitely like him. I think he was... Pretty much on par with value, maybe a smidge early, but Creed Humphrey was on the board. The Oklahoma center, who to me was the top interior offensive lineman when you take out Landon Dickerson because of injury. You look at Humphrey, he would have been a perfect fit here in that wide zone rushing offense, the ability to anchor and pass pro. I had the Packers taking him in my mock draft in the first round. So this is definitely shocking to me, but let's talk about Myers here. Definitely a really good player as well, can do all those things too, 
more of an inside zone running team that they were at Ohio State, but has the mobility, but has the mobility to reach block, being able to get Aaron Jones and company out to the edge. So he has all those abilities. He's an excellent zone blocker. Maybe not the greatest power in terms of a run blocker. More of a positional guy, being able to get in front of people on the second level of those combo blocks. Which, when you look at some of those fast guys that they have at the linebacker level in that division, makes some sense. There definitely were some issues in pass pro for Ohio State last season. And there are things that you can blame on him. I don't know exactly all the rules and protection, but you look at the Indiana game especially. There were people running free between him and Wyatt Davis, the right guard. But overall, very solid player. I just loved Humphrey and I still can't believe that they went Myers over Humphrey who went one spot later to Kansas City. So those guys just keep on winning, but we'll get to them down the road. So for the Packers now, third round, Amari Rogers Makes a lot more sense to me. Really tough physical slot receiver. And what I think he really does, Matt LaFleur and Green Bay, they didn't play a lot of 11 personnel last season. And mostly they had a lot of guys who can play that slot role. But in general, when they put three receivers out there, it wasn't really threatening to the defense. And Rodgers is not the type of player who will blow the top of the coverage. But you put him in there, he's going to be that bubble option on the backside of those run plays that they have. You have Devontae Adams, get him underneath him on like out routes and those bubbles like I said. And you put a ball in his hands and he's going to be a tough runner. He's going to churn out the outs for you. So I really like his fit here. Kind of reminds me of what they had a few years ago actually in Randall Cobb. Obviously not the type of offense that they were running. But like I said, this definitely signals to me that they want to play more 11 personnel, which they did some of the least of last season. Physical slot receiver, excellent route runner, catches everything thrown his way, will make things happen after the catch for them, not necessarily running away from people, but getting those tough yards and just making every touch count. And then we move on to day three here. First with Royce Newman, the offensive tackle out of Ole Miss. Athletic mover in the run game, not necessarily overwhelming in that regard, but makes some sense for the zone heavy rushing approach because he can make those cutoff or scoop blocks from the backside. Also, you saw a lot of those wraparound pulls if they want to use him that way. Good lateral agility in pass pro and pretty strong base, but certainly plays a little top heavy. And those rushers who know how to mix up speed and power and can incorporate those push pull maneuvers can definitely give him some trouble which is why I'd actually like him to transition to guard, which he played a lot of during Senior Bowl week, where you saw it, he was more comfortable with those shorter sets, being able to get his hands on people quickly. So maybe not the best option for a replacement at right tackle and has some developing to do. So I thought in the fourth round, maybe a little early for him. And then to Daryl Slayton, defensive tackle out of Florida, 6'5", 340, really a nose tackle for them with a lot of raw power. And some surprising quicks at times, but often finds himself a tick late and just very limited pass rush production. So I think they probably look at him as somebody to back up Kenny Clark at nose tackle, who can two gap right in the middle of that defense, add some size to that unit, but just nothing that really gets me out of my seat or anything like that. Shamachi and Charles, the cornerback out of App State, he primarily played boundary corner for them, and he plays with a lot of swagger. Only a lot of third of the passes thrown his way to be completed last season for just around 200 yards on about twice as many snaps and coverage. Very aggressive breaking on routes and that can oftentimes get him in trouble a little bit because he gets their hair early and gets penalized for it. But very natural matching skills as a coverage defender, can stick with receivers across the field, springy feet, very disruptive at the catch point. And he only missed one tackle last season, doesn't really show any hesitancy, coming up in the run game, not the greatest size, and I think early on he will draw a lot of penalties if you put him out there. But as a developmental player on the outside, who has those starter traits, I definitely like that. Then you have Colvin Lanen out of Wisconsin, who played left tackle for the Badgers, and when you look at his athletic testing, there's almost no way that he's going to stick on the outside. Technically sound guy but definitely slow in his footwork, not like overpowering people in the run game. He's a guy who was very impressive early on with the Badgers, but the more you're watching, the more he progressed, you didn't see that ability, just not the athletic tools to develop into a high level starter, I believe. So he's going to be more of a depth piece, which they added a lot of young guys last year, 
So I would not be shocked if he doesn't make the team. But I think in terms of tackles, if they believe that he can play out there, which I have some doubts about, but they do run a lot of play action off that run game, not a lot of true deep dropbacks. I could see them look at him as a tackle potentially. And then with Isaiah McDuffie, the linebacker at Boston College, he's kind of the opposite in terms of an undersized linebacker who is really running around, making a lot of plays, getting involved, working around blockers. But he has his issues dealing with guys who come directly at him. That lack of size definitely hurts him in the run game. And he gets himself out of position, covering running backs out of the backfield a lot of times, prematurely opening his hips and allowing them to beat him across his face. Those type of things that he definitely has to work on. I think he's going to primarily be a special teams guy. Maybe you get him out there on some sub downs when you ask him to play zone coverage. But like I said, primarily on special teams, just the energy he brings, the way he's running around in the field. I think that definitely makes some sense. And then seventh round, oh my gosh, Kylan Hill, the running back out of Mississippi State. One of my favorite picks of the entire draft. He was my sixth overall running back. I think he was the 17th drafted. Just that alone is crazy to me. Didn't really finish his college career on the highest note, getting injured a couple of games into a senior campaign. But you watch him in 2019, just the ability as a runner to manipulate defenders, open running lanes for himself. Kind of gets caught in the backfield, a little too much movement there at times. But you watch him in the pass game in particular, as a pass protector, despite not being the biggest guy, his take on technique, being able to sink his hips and square guys up, it is one of the best that I've seen from a guy who is sub 220 pounds. And as a receiver, such natural skills. Like he was actually running routes down the field. He can shake guys out of the boots on like angle routes and options, but also wheels and even corner routes, that type of stuff. You look at Aaron Jones, he can do a lot of those things. But after him, AJ Dillon, the second round of last year, he's not staying on the field and passing downs. Like protection, just catching the ball overall. Definitely not his strong suits, which is why I thought it was pretty crazy to get him in the second round in today's NFL. But you get Calvin Hill in the seventh round. I think he's going to be second on this team in terms of touches at the running back position, obviously behind Aaron Jones. And it might take a little bit of time for him. But he's a guy that I want out there on passing downs and somebody who is more dynamic than Dylan. I think he's going to finish second on this team in terms of snaps at the running back position. So overall, you look at the first few picks. They were around value, maybe all a little bit early, just nothing that's really exciting. And I think the first three will be starters. Then a lot of guys who I believe will sit on the bench primarily and play on special teams. The two guys that excite me, Ashamachi and Charles, who I think has some potential at the corner position. And then like I just talked about, Callum Hill. I think he's a phenomenal steal back there. And with that, we move on to the final team of this division with the Minnesota Vikings. So they went round 1, 23rd overall, Christian Derrissaw, offensive tackle, Virginia Tech. Round 3, they had 4 picks, 66th overall, Callum Mond, quarterback out of Texas A&M. 78th overall, Chas Surratt, linebacker, North Carolina. 86th overall, Wyatt Davis, interior offensive lineman, Ohio State. And 90th overall, Patrick Jones, the edge rusher out of Pittsburgh. Then in the 4th round, they had 3 more picks, 119th overall, Kenan Wangu, running back at Iowa State. 125th overall, Cameron Bynan, counterback slash safety out of Cal. 134th overall, Janaris Robinson, another edge rusher out of Florida State. And then in the 5th round, 2 more picks, Emir smith Masset, wide receiver out of Iowa. And 168th overall, Zach Davidson, the tight end out of Central Missouri. And finally, 6th round, 199th overall, Jalen Twyman, the interior defensive lineman out of Pitt. So, kind of have to catch my breath here. 11 picks that they actually made. Tied for the most in this draft. And let's start at the top here. There is saw, to me, one of the biggest steals out there. 23 is exactly 10 spots of where I project him to go in my mock draft and where I had him in my personal rankings. I think after Penny Sewell and Rashawn Slater, he was the clear cut number three overall tackle. And he's a perfect fit for them at left tackle because he was already blocking a lot of outside zone at Virginia Tech, being able to seal guys on the inside or just widen the edge and have the running back get up the B gap. Obviously, having Khalil Herbert there, who I talked about with the Bears, definitely helped him be right in that regard. And there are some things that he has to clean up as well in pass pro, in his pass sets. But he showed phenomenal improvement last season, I thought. Pretty much shutting on ACC rushes. You watch the Miami game, 
going up against Quincy Roche, who's a good edge rusher in his own right, and he just shut him out the whole day. And in the run game with him, it almost looks effortless, which I heard some people talk about him being lazy, and I really think it's not that. I just think that he doesn't have to, like, strain when he's moving guys. Like, he's just pushing guys effortlessly, and he has that athletic footwork to get in front of guys on those reach blocks, get his ball carry out to the edge. So I think him with Dalvin Cook, that is going to be phenomenal. And over Riley Reef as well, as a pass protector, he's an upgrade in that regard as well. So great pick all around. And then Callum Mont, he was actually, what was it then? The seventh quarterback drafted, because he had three guys go with him, four picks. After the top five, obviously, that went in the first 15 picks overall. And I like Mont the best out of those guys. And this is about where I valued him as a mid third round pick. I think he's really the only guy after the big five that I looked at as somebody who I see as a developmental starter down the road. Obviously, they have Kirk Cousins right now, who is an underrated quarterback in my opinion, because he's always getting hated on, even though he's probably on the fringe of top 10 every year. And he's probably going to be on the books for another couple of years. But Mond is somebody, like I said, two years from now, if you get off the Kirk Cousins deal and you like the way he's developing, I could see him becoming a starter eventually. Very mechanical thrower, which is good in one way with the consistent delivery, but not necessarily great in another, in terms of just being kind of robotic in that regard, not being able to change up arm angles and really put different spins on the ball. I would definitely like him to be a little more creative and actually use his legs to his advantage to just extend plays and make things happen that way. But that definitely has a lot to do with coaching from Jimbo Fisher, just sitting back there in the pocket and making his reads. You get him out there in a the quick game, he's going to deliver the ball on time. And really the big issues with him, when you look at some of the bad decisions that he made, you watch the Alabama game, for example. Like, he was covering him up at some point, and then he just threw all these different things at him that you rarely see from any college defense play. But, like I said, there's a lot of things to like here in terms of the athleticism, being able to run with the ball, the big arm to push it down the field, that quick release that he has, just being very automatic with that release overall. He was by far my favorite quarterback after the top five. And I think unlike the other two, with Cal Trask in particular, and then also Davis Mills, I have Mond in a different category, far ahead of those guys. So this definitely works for me. Then you have Chas Surratt, the linebacker in North Carolina. Not the biggest fan, to me a little early here. Not really a very physical player for the linebacker position. A former quarterback who absolutely came along and played a lot of good ball last season. Brings you a lot of range in the pass game and has some natural instincts for the position. Not having played it until these last couple of years. Like I said, I think a little bit early maybe. But to get him in that room with Anthony Barr and Eric Kendricks and somebody you can put out there on passing downs to some degree, especially if you want to rush Barr and need another guy on that second level to cover, I like how he presents. And then Wyatt Davis, to me, he's going to be another starter at either guard spot. Like, that interior offensive line, they've had some trouble there with Pat Alfline, all those guys running through. I think now they have kind of settled in there. And I think Wyatt Davis, if you put him in there, He's another upgrade to go with Derisaw. You get two stars on the offensive line. That is great. And I'm kind of giving an overview here. Patrick Jones and Janaris Robinson. Two developmental edge rushers. With Jones in particular. I was more excited going into the 2020 season about him. Because of that reckless style of play. Just scanning up the field. The explosiveness. And just the violence that he played with. But far too often getting pushed up the arc. Not being able to flatten to the quarterback. Didn't have a great pro day. So I thought this maybe was a little bit early for him as well. But I definitely see the tools to develop him. And Janaris Robinson, very similar in that regard. More of a thicker body. Maybe not the type of get-off. Just being able to win with speed around the edge. But a lot of natural power to him. And a lot of skills that you can develop. Just that suddenness to get around blockers. Those are exactly the type of players. Did you see Mike Zimmer and that staff bring in and develop every single year. The two picks in between that are the ones that I really don't love. In Cameron Bynum, I just can't see playing corner. He got abused routinely during senior bowl week, with the only receiver that he had any success against being Racy McMath from LSU, who had like an all-time bad showing down in Mobile. Bynum has some good size at 6 foot, 200 pounds, and one of the most aggressive run-defending defensive backs in this draft. 
but I really think he's going to transition to safety, and I just think this was definitely early for him. And getting one good running back out of Iowa State, if I remember correctly here, the sixth running back off the board, maybe seventh, that is way too early for me. I had him in the early 20s, and I really think he was a special teams pick because they needed somebody to return kicks. One of the worst teams in terms of the kick return yardage. And he has a lot of experience doing and he has a lot of <laughs> and he has a lot of experience returning kicks, has an explosive ability, not the most natural runner, doesn't really give you much in terms of just helping the offensive line out, being able to press one side and be able to cut back. Just very simple in that way. Not the most natural guy in terms of setting up blocks. You don't really see him much in pass protection. I think really he was a special teams pick particularly, and I obviously had him way later. But then Emir Smith was set in the fifth round out of Iowa. I really like what he presents in terms of somebody who was used a lot in those jet sweeps and like screens, reverses, all that kind of stuff. Just get the ball in his hands and let him go to work, as well as vertically getting down the field and beating safeties as a slot receiver. I could easily see him being the wide receiver free behind Phelan and Justin Jefferson. A little bit of a different dimension that they didn't necessarily have on that roster already. So I really liked that pick and I thought he could potentially go on day two. So the value is definitely fine with me as well. And then Zach Davis in the tight end out of central Missouri. Big athletic tight end. It's definitely going to be a jump for him. Going from, what is it, Division 2, now to the NFL. But excellent athletic testing. He can really stretch down the seams. And you, if you put him out there with Irv Smith, and you put him with Irv Smith, their young tight end, who did now want to really promote in that starting job, put him and Davidson on either side of the line of scrimmage, and just let them run down the seams. You put those safeties on the heels, and then you can run stuff underneath, open up space that way. I think him in the fifth round is perfectly fine. And then Jalen Twyman, one pick before you get to the 200s. That's about where I valued him. After what he showed in 2019, had one of the more productive seasons for defensive tackle. You would have expected him to go earlier, but a really bad pro day. I think that's what really dropped him in a lot of people's minds. But he put on the tape, he gets overwhelmed with power. Not really much of a plan or great technique as a pass rusher. There's nothing that really stands out to me. So you look at the production, not really matching the tape that you see. But you get him there, sixth round. As another body on the inside that you can put out there on passing downs in particular. That works. Overall class, phenomenal at the top. Pro Bowl level left tackle will be an immediate upgrade. You get another start in the offensive line, I believe. A potential starting quarterback two years from now. Who, at the very least, you will add some competition to that room. After Kirk, they really didn't have anybody on that roster. And then a lot of developmental players that Minnesota likes to bring in to go with some offensive weapons with Emir Smith Massett and Zach Davidson, who in specific roles can have an impact early on. So overall a very good class as well. And let's just rank these here real quickly. And I actually cheated a little bit here. I call it 1A, 1B and 1C between the Bears, Lions and Vikings. And if I had to rank them it would be 1, 2, 3 in that order. But I just wanted to make clear the distance between those three drafts and Green Bay's. And it's not like they had a horrible draft or anything like that. But I just think the Bears getting the franchise quarterback. Just all the moves that they made overall. Maybe they paid a little too much for it. But if it works out, you get a starting quarterback of the future. A starting tackle. Guys that will be competing for a lot of snaps. I really love what they did. Then the Detroit Lions. They very much did it in a mold that they would say they would with those kneecap biters like I said. And just getting those physical players. Just adding a character to that team. I love what they did. And the Minnesota Vikings. I just discussed them. Some great upgrades right now. And players that will help them down the road. Packers, like I said, not a bad draft. I thought a lot of the picks early on were with value. A couple of late round guys that I liked for them. But nothing that blows me away. Not necessarily any real difference makers, I would say. So that's gonna do it. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, share it with a couple of friends, and definitely make sure to tune in later this week where we're going to be talking about the AFC North. And like I said, these next four weeks are going to be all draft breakdowns, going through every single division. At the moment I'm recording this, the schedule release is tonight for me, and I'm going to be looking for that. Maybe I'm going to have some write-up on my page next week, so make sure to check that out. 
Uh, but like I said, definitely those draft breakdowns, those are going to be coming to you twice a week. And we're kind of getting to at that point of the off season. But trust me, I have a lot of things in the work. And if you like my breakdowns, I will definitely keep you entertained throughout this long summer. Just make sure to like, subscribe, uh, follow me on my social media. All the handles for that are down below in the description. And always feel free to contact me anywhere. If you have any recommendations for the content or just some of the comments that you want to make, feel free to do anything like that. So until then, see you later. Peace.